guys, remain standing if you would with me. Remain standing if you would with me. I want to read a portion of scripture to you this morning before you sit down. And then we're going to pray real quick. Matthew chapter 16. And I'm going to start in verse 8. And it says like this. You have such little faith. Why are you arguing with one another about having no bread? I know nobody at Thanksgiving was arguing about not enough rolls, right? Then all the good rolls are gone and they put the bad... Yeah, anyways. (laughs) Are you so slow to understand... Have you forgotten the miracle of feeding the 5,000 families and how each of you ended up with a basket full of fragments and how seven loaves of bread fed 4,000 families and with baskets left over? Don't you understand? I'm not talking about bread, but I'm warning you to avoid the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And finally, they realized what he was talking about, that he was talking about yeast found in bread. But the error of the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. God, we thank you because we are not enough without you. You make us enough. God, we thank you because in your word today, God, you are going to enlighten us. God, you are going to bring to our remembrance what you said about who we are and where we're going and what you can do with our little. Father, we thank you this morning for all that you're doing in each and every one of us. Give me grace today, Father, that I may communicate this message today that would encourage and inspire those who would hear in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated this morning. If I could title my message this morning, my title would be Leftovers. Yeah, how many of y'all got some leftovers? Yeah, Yeah, everybody loves leftovers. You know, so I put this post on Facebook um, a couple of days ago before Thanksgiving happened. I said, when I say the word leftovers, like what's the first thing that comes to your mind? And some of you like, like, gross, I don't want leftovers or nasty. Some of you are like, I can't wait for leftovers. But here's the most common response I got. It depends on who made it. Right? It depends on who made it. And I thought, like, it depends on who made it. Like, who made it? Because if it's a really good cook, then I can't wait for the leftovers because it must be still really good. Right? Here's what I want to tell you this morning. That God doesn't make leftovers that aren't good. Right? So, so when, when God created something and he made, and there was leftovers, talking about the 5,000 uh, the, the families that he fed, the 12 baskets and the 7 baskets. And, and by the way, if you didn't know, there was two different occasions. In chapter 14, Jesus blessed, takes two fish and five loaves. And in, verse, in chapter 16, he takes, or uh, chapter 15, he takes um, seven loaves. It doesn't say how many fish. And the first time he feeds 5,000, the second time he feeds 4,000, right? And so I just want, I want you to get that in your head this morning. Because I think it's important for us to understand, like, why did Jesus have, why was there leftovers, and we often talk about the miracle. We talk about, wow, God, you, you broke the bread and you blessed it. Wow, woohoo, it's awesome. But we don't talk about the leftovers. What is the significance of the leftovers? And that's what I want to talk to you this morning about, the significance of the leftovers. But I'm going to go over a, a, a few different portions of Scripture before we get there because I think it's important for us to understand what's happening here. Is that okay? So if you have your Bibles with you, my glasses. Oh, don't get old and have to wear glasses. Matthew chapter 14. Let's go to Matthew chapter 14. I'm going to read a little bit today, if that's okay with everybody. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. I'm going to start in verse 13. And I'm going to read all the way down to 20. Where are you at? Oh, there you are. You're in the middle of the page. On hearing this, Jesus slipped away privately by boat to be alone. But when the crowds discovered he had sailed away, they emerged from all, from all the, they emerged from all the nearby towns and followed him on foot. So when Jesus landed, he had a huge crowd waiting for him, seeing so many people. His heart was deeply moved with compassion toward them. So he healed all the sick who were in the crowd. Can I just stop here for just a second? If you're here this morning and you have sickness in your body, I want you to know that God is here and he can heal your body this morning. If you're here this morning and your marriage is ill, I want you to know that this morning there is a God in the room that can heal your marriage. If if this is your first time at Changing Point Church 
and, and you've never been here before, and, and, and you came because, you, you know, there's something going on in your life and you need God to do a miracle, I want you to know this morning that there is a God in the room who can perform a miracle in your life this morning. I want you to know that God deeply cares about you this morning. That you didn't show up here this morning by happenstance or coincidence. You showed up this morning on time because God wanted to meet you here this morning. And maybe you feel like maybe it was your wife that was nagging you or your husband that was nagging you or your kids that were nagging, can we get to church? That had nothing to do with it. God wanted you here this morning so you would know this morning that he loves you right where you were at. The Bible says that he was deeply moved by them coming to him. And God is deeply moved this morning that you would show up in his house this morning and he's ready to perform a miracle in your life this morning. It has nothing to do with my message. I wanted to get that out to you. Verse 15, later that afternoon, the disciples came to Jesus and said, it's going to be dark soon and people are hungry, but there's nothing to eat here in this desolate place. You ever been in a desolate place and thought, man, ain't nothing to eat here. Like, you know, sometimes we go up hunting and I got this really cool app. It's called, what's it called? On X, I think it's called, right? It's a, it's a super awesome app. And if I didn't have it, I'd probably get lost in the woods. Um, because you, you know how easy it is to get turned around in the woods? It's like super easy because every tree looks the same. <laughs> right? And so thank God for the map. But sometimes you're out there and you're hungry. And I don't worry about hunger because I know where the truck's at because I got my little map. But sometimes you can be in a des desolate place and wonder, God, where's my next meal coming from? And I'm not talking about food only. I'm talking about, God, where's love going to come from? Where's mercy going to come from? Where, I'm, in a, I'm in a place right now where I don't feel wanted or loved. They were hungry and Jesus was concerned with their hunger. And I want you to know this morning that Jesus is concerned with your hunger. You're hungry to be accepted. You're hungry to be loved. You're hungry to be noticed and recognized. You're hungry to want to be close to him. Amen? In verse 16 it says, they don't need to leave, Jesus responded. You can give them something to eat, they answered, but all we have is five barley loaves and two fish. Let me have them, Jesus replied. Then he then. Then he had everyone sit down in the grass. As he took the five loaves and the two fish, he took up into heaven, gave thanks to God, and broke the bread into pieces. He then gave it to his disciples. Who did he give it to? His disciples. Who in turn gave it to the crowd. And everyone ate until they were satisfied. How many of y'all ate until you were satisfied this weekend? How many ate until you were, oh, don't raise your hand, oversatisfied this weekend, Right? You know, some people visit the porcelain god because they overdrank, and some people vi visit the porcelain god because they overate, right? So I hope he wasn't one of those, but they were satisfied. For the food was multiplied in front of their very eyes. They picked up the leftovers and filled 12 baskets full. Look at your neighbor and say, 12 baskets full. How many disciples were there? 12 disciples. Each disciple got a basket. Full of leftovers. Each disciple got a basket full of leftovers. If you are here for the very first time, I want to remind you again that Jesus loves you. And that he wants to multiply for you. But if you're here this morning and you've been a Christian for a little while, you've been serving God for a little bit, I want you to recognize who picked up the 12 baskets. It wasn't the crowd that picked up the 12 baskets of leftovers. It was the disciples that picked up the 12 baskets of leftovers. And I wonder like sometimes, you know, when you're, you're at Thanksgiving or you're, you're, you're entertaining people at your house and, and you know, the party is over and, and, and it's time to pick up stuff. I wonder how many of us like, are like, oh God, really? Now I got to pick up everybody's business. If you come to my house, I'm not trying to kick you out. I just don't like stuff being left around. And so if I start picking up your plate and you weren't done, my bad. It's just I don't like to see it and nobody's using it. So I'm going to put it away, right? It's not, I don't mean no disrespect by it. If you still want it, let me know you still want it and I'll leave it there. But if not, I'm putting it away, right? But the 12 disciples, I can't imagine, we're sitting there like, okay, Jesus, there's 5,000 people. You know how much mess 5,000 people are going to make? That's a lot of mess. And Jesus says, I need you to go and collect the leftovers, I want you to collect the leftovers. Why do you want us to collect the leftovers? I'm going to tell you about why a little bit later. But I want you to remember that it was the disciples' responsibility to collect the leftovers. It was their job, not the crowd's job. It was their job to collect the leftovers. If you're a parent in the house and God does a miracle in your life, it's not your kids' job to collect the leftovers. It is your job to collect the leftovers. It's your... I'm going to get ahead of myself. Just, I want you to put that out there. In 2 Corinthians 9.8, somebody go to 2 Corinthians 9.8 for me. 
2 Corinthians 9, chapter 8. I'm reading this in, in the NLT. You got your, I'm, I'm going to give you some scripture this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And it says like this. I'm going to read it. It says, and God will generously provide all your need. Some of your need? All. all of your need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. God doesn't give us leftovers to keep them to ourselves. God gives us leftovers so we can share them with other people. Oh, try not to get ahead of myself. I just want you to remember, God, God doesn't give you leftovers just for you. God gives you leftovers so that you can share with somebody else. And so we have this, this, this American mentality. This American mentality, we always make too much. Like, it's funny, I watch my kids sometimes fill their plates, and I'm, I already know, they are not going to eat it all. <laughs> but it looks so good, and so they just pile their plate. I don't know if you're one of those people. You just pile your plate and pile your plate because it's so good. And it's like you're never going to ever eat again, and so you want to make sure you get all you can. But then you sit there at the, at the end of like 10 bites or so, and you're like, oh, my God, I am, what am I going to do with all this food? And then you force yourself to eat it because, you, you know, when you grew up, your mom probably told you that there are starving people around the world who don't have it, so you better eat it all. Right? Nobody in, yeah, just me, okay. Um, and so anyways, you know, so, so we, 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 we eat it all, and then afterward we're laying on the couch, we're like, oh, my God, I'm going to die, right? It's, but God gave you plenty left over, not just for you, but to share with other people. And I think sometimes we have taken on this American culture, this American mindset that says, no, it's, it's, it's left over. What are you going to do with it? Throw it away. Just throw it away. Right? Have you ever, have you ever been to a, a, a restaurant and, and you order too much and, and, they, and you get this little box and you bring it home? Most of us will take that box, take it home, and we'll put it in the refrigerator and like three weeks later say, what in the world is that? And throw it away because you forgot you had leftovers, right? And we're, we're so accustomed to just getting rid of stuff, throwing things away. It's a disposable thing. We throw the leftovers away. And I want you to know today that God doesn't want you to throw your leftovers away. away. God wants you to share your leftovers with other people. He doesn't want you to forget what he did in your life. He wants you to remember what he did in your life. That remembering is the, I'm going to get ahead of myself. See, I'm trying to get, slow down. Matthew 15, 1 through 10. Matthew 15, 1 through 10. Then, guys, if you are, if you are doing devotions with us, we're, we, we're just coming out of Matthew. We've been in Matthew like all month long, right? And so I'm coming from, from our devotion time, from some different stories that I felt the Lord really speak to my heart. And I'm going to go somewhere with this. You just hang on, for me, hang on with me for a little bit. Then the Pharisees and religious scholars came from Jerusalem. And I love this. And approached Jesus with this question. Why do your disciples ignore the traditions of our elders? For example, they, do, they don't ceremonially wash their hands before they eat bread. Y'all should be washing your hands before you eat bread, just saying. If you're putting your hands in that muffin basket and you didn't wash your hands, you, you should probably wash your hands. <laughs> Jesus answered, watch this, I love this. And Jesus answered, why do you ignore the commandment of God because of your tradition? For didn't God say, honor your mother and father, and whoever abuses insults his father and mother must be put to death? But you teach that it's permissible to say to your parents when they are in financial need, Whatever gift you would have received from me, I can keep for myself, since I decided it is an offering to God. This doesn't honor your mother and father, and you have, to, you have elevated your tradition above the word of God. Sometimes we elevate our traditions above the word of God, but we've always done it that way. But is it line up with the word of God? But we've always did this, and we've always said this, and we've always, does it line up with the Word of God? And Jesus is trying to get them to understand that we have to line our traditions up with the Word of God. Is your tradition contrary to the Word of God? Don't elevate your tradition above God's Word. And then he says this in verse 7, frauds and hypocrites, Isaiah described you perfectly when he said, these people honor me with their words, and their hearts are so very distant from me. They pretend to worship me, but their worship is nothing more than an empty tradition of empty traditions of men. Then Jesus turned to the crowd and said, come, listen, and open your heart to understanding. I was sharing this with somebody the other day. The greatest distance for humanity, for humanity is not from here to Canis Majoris. If you don't know who Canis Majoris is, then you got to get to an encounter. <laughs> we will teach you about Canis Majoris, right? The greatest distance for humans is not from here to a, a faraway planet. The greatest distance for humanity is from right here to right here. 
We try so hard to understand God with this that we miss God with this. And what God is teaching the disciples here and what God is teaching the Pharisees and the Sadducees here is I need you to listen to me with your heart. Quit trying to put me in the box of your mind. I need you to get outside the box of your mind and know that I can take two fish and five loaves and I can feed 5,000. I can take seven loaves and I can feed 4,000. And there's going to be so much left over. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to anybody, but I need you to trust me with your little bit. Get outside of your tradition. But God, if I do this and I do this and I do this, two plus two equals four, yes, in our mind. But in two plus two in God's mind, it could equal 4,000. And sometimes we got to get outside of trying to understand God. But God, why do they do this and why do they sing like this and why do they dance like this and why do they speak in tongues like that? Quit trying to understand God and listen to God with your heart. Listen to God with your heart. All right. Matthew 23, 37. The great commandment. If you, if you, okay, so those of you guys who are life group leaders and, and, and you're in, in life group, you should know this. The great command, Matthew 22, 37, and 40. Anybody know? Anybody? What is it? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love God with all of your heart and love your neighbor. But it doesn't make sense to love my neighbor because this dog keeps pooping in my yard. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to, to, to love that lady who walked out of Walmart and flipped me off for absolutely no reason. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbors. Get outside of what you think and what you feel and listen to the command of God. Love God with all of your heart and love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is the command that God gave us. Church, here's it, here it is. It's not hard. Pastor Eli was just talking about it's, We make it more difficult than it really is because we allow our feelings and our understanding to get in the way of connecting to the heart of God. And what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 15 is I need you to listen with your heart, not your feelings and not your mind. Some of, us, some of us didn't go to Thanksgiving with a family member because you're still trying to understand things through your some of you didn't make a phone call to that wayward son or that wayward daughter because you're still trying to understand God through your. Some of, us, some of us missed an opportunity to be with our loved ones because we're still trying to understand with our mind and we're not connecting with our heart. Your heart says forgive. You know it does. Your, guard, your heart says let go, but it doesn't make sense to let go. You don't know how bad they hurt me. Jesus is saying, I need you to understand with your heart. And it's so hard for the Pharisees and the Sadducees at this point in their life to understand it because they've, they've lived their life by so many rules for so long that they can't get outside of these rules and love God with your heart. And so Jesus is emphasizing this, I need you to love me with your heart. Isaiah 55, 1 through 13, I'm going to read the whole chapter. And I want you to get a hold of this. If you, if you don't have this, if you don't have this um, outlined, if you don't have this highlighted, highlight it. Isaiah 55, you ready? Isaiah 55. Is anyone thirsty? There's some of y'all thirsty in the room right now. He says, come and drink, even if you have no money. I can't afford it. I didn't ask you if you could afford it. He said, come and drink. Even if you have no money, come take your choice of wine or milk. It's free. It's not an open bar, guys. Some of y'all are like, oh, free wine. I'm, I'm, I'm there. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does, that does you no good? Listen to me, and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you the unfailing love I promised to David. Watch this. See how I used him to display my power in among, amongst all the people. I made him a leader among the nations. You also will command nations you don't know. You will command nations that you don't even know yet. God is going to put you in a position to lead people that you don't even know yet, but you got to listen with your and, and people don't know, running, and running to obey because I, the Lord your God, the Holy of Israel, have made you glorious. Seek 
the Lord while you can find him. Call him now while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing, of doing, uh, it doesn't say wrong. Oh yeah, doing wrong. There it is at the bottom of my book. <laughs> Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to God for he will forgive generously. Watch this, verse 8. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. In the same way, my word I send out and always produces fruit. It will accomplish what I want it to. It will prosper everywhere I sent it. You will live in joy and in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song and the trees in the fields will clap their hands. Where once there were thorns, there are cypress trees that will grow. Where there were nettles grow, where nettles grew, myrtle will sprout up. These events will bring great honor to the Lord's name. There will be an everlasting sign to his power. I just want to stop here for a minute because thorns represent a curse and the cypress tree represents the resistance of a curse. Where once you lived under a curse, God is going to make you resistant to the curse because his word says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, that he would raise a standard against him. And that standard is the word of God. And so you can't curse me because I serve a living God that lives inside of me. And there is no curse that's going to land on me that God can't take care of. Right? And then he goes on and he says, he says, we're nettle. You guys know what nettles are? They're, they're, this, they're this little plant and they're kind of heart-shaped, but they sting. You can't touch them because they're going to they're sting you. Where nettles once grow, I'm going to put myrtle. Myrtle is a symbol of God's love. So once where you had a love that hurt, God is going to replace it with a love that's everlasting. Here's what God is trying to get us to understand with our heart, not with our mind. God, I don't understand how you could love me. You have no idea what I've done. You have no idea what I've been through. God is saying, I'm going to take that curse that they put on you, and there's going to be no curse on you. I'm going to take that love that once hurt you, and I'm going to give you an everlasting love. I will need you to understand with your heart, though, not with your mind. Matthew 15, 21. Going back to Matthew. Matthew 15. Matthew 15, 21. Here's a familiar story to everybody. I'm going somewhere. Just hang on with me. Fifteen twenty one. Then Jesus left and went north into a non-Jewish region of Lebanon, he encountered there a Canaanite woman who screamed out to him. I wonder if you've ever had to scream out to the Lord. Lord, son of David, show mercy to me. My daughter is horribly afflicted by a demon that, lament, that torments her. But Jesus never answered her. So his disciples said to him, why do you ignore this woman who is crying out to us? Jesus said, I've only been sent to the lost sheep of Israel. But she came and bowed down before him and said, Lord, help me. Jesus responded, it's not right for a man to take the bread from his children and throw it out to the dogs. How many at that point would have just like bump you then? I'm out. Call me a dog. Then he said in verse 27, you're right, she replied. But even puppies get to eat the crumbs that fall from the prince's table. Then Jesus answered her, dear woman, your faith is strong. What you desire will be, will be done for you. And at that very moment, her daughter was instantly set free from a demonic torment. Somebody said, again, somebody said, when I'm thinking about leftovers, it depends on who made it. Jesus is sitting down and he's eating. And this woman comes and he says, and says, son of David... I need you to help my daughter. She's desperate for, for help. She's like, I know that you have something for me. And Jesus kind of, kind of, and it's not, in that time it wasn't rude. We, we look at it as like it was rude, but it wasn't really rude. She, she was, he was trying to help her understand that I came for this certain people, right? And she said, but even the puppies, even the dogs 
get to eat the crumbs from the table because the same power that's in the meal is in the crumb because it came from the very same thing. Just because it's a crumb doesn't mean it doesn't have power. Power doesn't be, Just because it's a crumb doesn't mean it doesn't have significance. Just because it's a crumb does not mean that God can't use it to bring healing. We often look at the leftover like it can't sustain. It's no good. It already happened. This is the leftover. This is the excess. But sometimes it's in the excess. That we overlook that God wants to move in. And God allowed that woman to be healed because she wasn't, she wasn't d- distracted by the fact that he said, you can't, have, you can't sit at my table. And so no matter if I'm at the table, if I'm around the table, or if I'm under the table, there is still something for me that God has. And so don't look at it. Listen, we look at it and say, well, well, I'm not Pastor Eli. I don't get to be on the stage. And I'm not PT and I don't get to sing. And I'm not a life group leader and I'm not a leader. Listen, you around the table, God has something for me. You on the table, God has something for me. You under the table, God has something for you. But we can't think from here. We got to think from here. Oftentimes we'll miss God and we'll miss the miracle that God has for us because we're, we don't feel like we're in the right position. God looked at the crowd, and he said, I was deeply moved by the crowd, and they came sick, and they came hurting, and they came lost, but he was deeply moved by them. God is moved by this woman who does not allow herself to get distracted or discouraged because she wasn't sitting at the table. Don't miss the miracle that God has for you because you're worried about where you're at. Where you're at right now at this very moment is the right place. God has a miracle for you in this house this morning. Matthew 15, 32 to 37. This is the second time that Jesus performs a miracle. And again, there are seven baskets of leftovers. I'm trying to hurry up. Matthew 16, 8 through 10 is where we started. Pastor Lee, why the leftovers? Why was Jesus so concerned with the leftovers? Because he knew that the disciples were going to be in a storm. And he wanted them to know that if I did it before and I did it again, that I could do it one more time. But here's the problem. The problem was when they were in the storm, they forgot. And Jesus had to remind them. Don't you remember that each of you walked away with the basket? What'd you do with the leftovers? Don't you remember I fed, there were seven baskets left over, I fed 4,000? Why are you so worried about the storm? Oftentimes the reason we're worried about the trials in our life is because we forgot what God brought us from. And the reason we forgot what God brought us from is because we didn't, we didn't take care of the leftovers well. Do you know that there is a very specific way to take care of your leftovers? Right? I didn't know this. I'm not, I don't cook food, and I don't take care of leftovers very well. Okay? If it's leftover, I'm one of those guys who just throw it away. I'm not going to eat it probably anyways. It's going to go in the refrigerator. It's going to stay there for like three days, four days, five days, a week, and then you're just going to mold on it. You're going to open it. Oh, I want And you throw it away. <laughs> Right? That, that's me. I'm not that guy. So I had, a, so I had a little bit of research. So I'm going to give you three things today. These are the three things I want you to walk away with today. How do I preserve the leftovers? How do I preserve the miracle in my life? The first thing you have to do is you have to cover the leftovers. Like, like you ever have a barbecue outside and, and you cook too much and, and there's a little bit of leftover and nobody's going to eat it and it's not covered and then the flies get, on, flies get on it. You see the flies and you're like, oh, get the flies out. I was watching this movie yesterday and his dad is cooking this hamburger and it falls on the floor and she, he picks it up, puts it back on the grill and the little girl comes like, dad, it fell on the floor. I said, oh, no, it's okay to burn it off. <laughs> Are you one of those? I'm one of those dads. Like, it's, it's all good. It'll be good, right? But the reason you cover the leftovers because covering the leftovers protects it from the flies, the bacteria, the garbage, the mess. Right? And watch this, watch this. When we don't cover the leftovers, when we don't cover the miracle, it gets infected with bacteria. When you don't cover what God did for you with prayer, when you don't cover what God did, God did for you, then, then something's going to come in and convince you that it wasn't God. Oh, come on, man. That wasn't really a miracle. You, you, you knew it was going to happen. 
cover the miracle of God. Because watch this, when you go through another trial and you haven't taken time to cover the miracle of God, the leftover that God left over, it's going to rob you of moving forward in the next season of your life. Cover it well. Pray over it. God, I thank you, God. We was in a car accident three weeks ago, four weeks ago, however long it was ago. But God, I thank you because that elk could have took us out, but it didn't take us out. Instead, God, there was room for a miracle. God, I'm going to cover the miracle. We shouldn't be here today, God. It should have went to the windshield. I don't know, but here's what I do know. I'm here today. And so I'm going to cover my miracle with some prayer. God has done something in your child's life. Cover that miracle with prayer. God has done something in your spouse's life. Cover that miracle with prayer. You got to cover the miracle. You got you to cover the leftovers, right? The second part is you got to wrap it. You got to wrap it. After you cover it, you got to wrap it. Proverbs 18.21. I'm not going to go there. Proverbs 18.21. Anybody know what Proverbs 18.21 says? On the tip of your tongue is life and death. Wrapping the leftovers Traps the moisture inside. Anybody have leftovers that haven't been wrapped? They're dry. You put it in the microwave, it ain't no good because it's dry. It got no moisture. Some of us are miracles so dry, you try pulling that miracle out, and it's like, it's dry. It don't even taste right anymore. It's because you didn't wrap it with your words. You, you cover it with the word of God, but you got to wrap it with your words. Because if you don't speak over it, somebody else is going to speak over it. If you ain't speaking over your children, somebody else is going to be speaking over your children. If you ain't speaking over your wife, somebody else is going to be speaking over your wife. Use your words because on your tongue is life and death. You got to wrap it with your words. Keep the moisture inside. I got a good marriage, man. I got good children. God, I got a good job. God, I go to a good church. I'm going to wrap it in my words. Because if we don't, the enemy comes and says, oh, my marriage ain't so good, and, and my kids aren't so smart, and my church ain't so good, and my, my city ain't so good. We start speaking negativity over it. And so it has no moisture. It ain't good. It don't taste good anymore. So after you cover it, you protect it from the bacteria, you got to wrap it in your word. And then watch this, the last thing. You got to seal it. If you don't seal it, if you don't seal it, it'll start getting the odor of the other food in the refrigerator. If you don't seal it, it's going to start smelling like something else. Now watch this. Comparison and you've heard this before. I don't even know where I, maybe Pastor Eli said it. I don't know where I heard it from. Maybe it was in a book I read. Comparison is the breeding ground for disappointment. If you do not seal it, you'll start comparing it to other things. And then you're going to be disappointed. Well, maybe God, maybe God didn't do it for me as good as he did it for somebody else. Well, maybe my miracle isn't as significant as somebody else's miracle. Cover it, wrap it, and seal it with the word of God. Watch this. Jesus told each one of the disciples to get their own basket. And he doesn't say that this basket had 12 and this basket had 12. and This This basket could have had one and that one could have had five and that one could have had ten. It didn't matter. He said, I need you to get your basket because that basket is what's going to get you through the next season of your life. Not your your friend's basket. What does your basket have in it? What does your miracle smell like to you? Because if you're too busy not sealing your miracle, not sealing the thing that God has done in your life, and you start smelling everybody else's, it'll start making yours seem like it wasn't significant, it wasn't very good. Seal the word of God. Seal the miracle with the word of God. Watch this last thing I'm going to give you today. At the beginning of Matthew, we read Jesus in the wilderness. And when he's in the wilderness, the enemy comes in. And he gives him three temptations. 
And each one of these start with the same exact words. If you be the Son of God. Right? If you be the Son of God, turn these stones into... If you be the Son of God, jump. If you be the Son of God, kneel down and worship. Jesus' response to every single one of these temptations was the same. The Scripture says, the Scripture says... The scripture says. In this season that we are in, this holiday season, it's going to be easy to find excuses not to connect to people, not to come to church, not to memorize the scripture. I'm busy. I got a million things to do. I got to put up the lights and I got to rearrange the house, and I, gotta, I got all this stuff I got to do. But I will remind you of something. Don't let your tradition be elevated above God's commandment. Don't let your tradition be elevated above God's commandment. Don't forget the miracle that he performed in your life that got you to this place. Lest we start forgetting the important things. I think, I, think, I think the disciples, Jesus needed the disciples and needed us to remember that God is still a God of miracles. And that if we don't take care of what he's already giving us and we start to lose sight of the good things that God is doing in our lives, then we will very quickly become the very thing we said we would never do. Anybody ever say to themselves, I will never do that, and then you find yourself doing it? That happens because we didn't cover it, we didn't wrap it, and we didn't seal it. And so my encouragement to you this morning is take some time. And here's, here's honestly what I, I told my wife. I said, this would be really cool. We don't have the time to do this, but, but, but here's what I, I really thought would be really cool. You know out there in the little, the little roundabout thing out there, the little island that we got out there? We got, we got some stones in there, some, some rocks in there. And I thought it would be really cool if we all went out there and grabbed a stone. And we all wrote on one of those stones the miracle that God did in your life. What did, what did God do for you? In 2022, what did God do for you? And you write that on that stone in a permanent marker and you set it out there. And then anytime you feel like, God, I, 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 I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I want you to go back to that little roundabout, a little, little island out there. I want you to pick up one of those stones. And it may not even be your stone. It may be somebody else's stone. But that we wouldn't forget what God done for us. And so if you didn't do this, we did this this Thanksgiving. We, we, went, we were at my, my, my brother-in-law's house, and we sat down, and we began to write everybody, everybody the, from the youngest to the oldest. We all wrote something that God did for us in 2020, and we all walked, went around them. We all shared it. Right? And, and so here's what we do every year. It's a tradition. Now it's every year. Now we're going to create a big old book of all the things. Because here's what we don't want. We don't want to walk 400 years in slavery because we forgot what God did. I don't want your children to forget the goodness of God. And so this morning, my hope is to remind you. My hope is to remind you to not forget the leftovers. To preserve the good things that God has for you. Amen?